Chapter 10. Course Correction Yeah, it's a good thing they aren't paying me to agree with them. Holy fire, my ass. Fireworks. Pinky Bell, no, Silver Bell. I really should think of her as Silver Bell. Called it Fireworks. She had been saving it until her Pinkie Pie Museum collection was complete. Of course, if you were going to throw a party to end all parties, you would need fireworks. Is that what I think it is? Railwright moaned, staring at the strange object full of pulsing, twisting colors from the open barn door, not willing to take a step inside. Outside, beyond him, I could see Ditsy Do helping a little filly into her delivery wagon. I deliver absolutely everything, was emblazoned on the side, along with a constellation of circles that I suppose was the ghoul pony's trademark. Watcher had come through again, and a sprite bot silently wandered into the farm deep into the night. Watcher was keeping an eye out for us. My slightly creepy guardian stranger. It had taken considerably less persuasion to get Watcher to contact Bitsy Do again for help. Maybe it was because Velvet Remedy's warning had still been fresh in my head, and I had asked nicely, saying please, this time. More likely, was because Watcher had totally freaked out the moment I had led the Sprite Bot into the barn. Watcher's panicked reaction to the object in the barn had been unexpected and frightening. Rather unlike Velvet Remedy's more refined freakout, when she met Ditsy Doo. Once I'd reassured her that the ghoul pony was a friend, and not a ravenous zombie pony, like the herd which had chased us down yesterday, Velvet had smiled and acted perfectly polite. But she was still keeping her distance and giving the ghoul horrified looks. I think the medical pony inside of her was having an allergic reaction to the very existence of pony ghouls. I had expected Ditsy Doo's personal arrival, Silverbell needed help, and we couldn't provide it ourselves. There was a possible place in Manhattan that could help the poor filly if it still existed. But, as my oh-so-uneventful trek across the equestrian wasteland had already proven, it was far too dangerous to drag some pony like Silverbell along. She needed love and comfort, safety, and prolonged therapy. Wandering the wasteland wouldn't provide that. And another hostile encounter might scar her even worse. I worried that her pain and wounds were too deep to heal already. I couldn't risk that. And, with a lack of alternatives, New Appaloosa was the only real option I saw. And with that, I knew of Ditsy Doo. It would be hard to find some pony better than her. Outside of a professional psychiatric pony. And I knew Ditsy Doo would really care about her. I had not expected Railwright to arrive in the wagon, and although he seemed pleasant before, something about his visit felt foreboding. I turned away from him and back towards the strange object, careful to look slightly above into the side of it rather than right into its swirling surface. Yep, Clementy was standing just inside the barn having pulled the door open. He too refused to get much closer, although out of reasonable caution rather than abject fear. That's a balefire bomb. Pinky Bell had an undetonated mega spell in her barn for fireworks. Shafts of pure sunlight pierced the air from hundreds of tiny breaks in the omnipresent cloud cover. It was like the night I first stepped out of Stable 2, only instead of a fathomless abyss sprinkled with stars, what shone through the s above sky was the most beautiful blue. I wanted the sky so badly, but the brakes closed up even faster than they appeared. By noon, the gray covering would be solid again. Ditsy Doo had wrapped Silver Bell in a blanket and was strapped herself to the front of the wagon, with practice ease. She caught me watching her and smiled back. 
one odd eye rolling up. I tried not to shudder at that, and gave her my best smile back. Then cast a mild, reproachful gaze towards the stack of barrels that Velvet Remedy was trying to remain in the vicinity of without actually hiding. What in tarnation do you plan to do with that thing? Calamity was asking, real right, as they clopped away from the barn. I'd suggest collapsing the barn on it, but that might set it off. Hell, for all we know, moving it might set the god darn thing off. Railright neighed. I have no idea. He held up a hoof to block Calamity. Y'all mind if I have a word with Little Pip? Alone like? Calamity shrugged and trotted over to Dipsy Doo. Railright approached me. My sense of unease increased. You know, if you keep sending us folks, we're going to have to build a bigger town, he began casually, but I detected a stone turn, a stone tone underneath. Well, I'm hoping to free a lot more ponies from slavers, I admitted, thinking once again of Philadelphia. But I'm only sending them to you because you're the kindest, most decent folk I've met so far. In all honesty, I was beginning to feel a little uncomfortable sending ponies to live in a town that had a history of trading with slavers. I only hoped the influx of mistreated slaves might swing their view. Don't get me wrong, I admire what you're trying to do. You're out there slaving lives, and there ain't a pony complaining about that. We'll give them a good home and see the little filly and the others from old Appaloosa are cared for right. Here it comes, I thought. But... Railright grimaced. Y'all are reckless and dangerous. You got six of our best train ponies slaughtered. Some of them being friends of mine for longer than I can remember. You destroyed one of our only functioning trains. And y'all pretty much set fire to any peaceful relations New Appaloosa had managed with the slavers. I'll have to be putting extra guard ponies on the walls now. And we'll be needing to send more guards with the caravans. Honestly, I'm worried if we got enough ammo in the town, if and they should decide to take things out on us for what yell ponies did. I fell back into my hunches, ears flat. My heart was sinking. I'm so sorry to tell you this. I truly am. But y'all aren't exactly welcome back in New Appaloosa anymore. He tried to soften the blow. At least, not for a good long while. I felt a little numb. Railright glanced over his flank to where Ditsy Doo and Calamity were stomping hooves, bartering over the scavenged goods that had begun to weigh down our saddlebags. Railright rolled his gaze back to me. Ditsy Doo has been damned insistent about trading with you, but I've convinced her to conduct her business with y'all at the gates. The cloud ceiling had fully mended itself, casting the equestrian wasteland once again into a dreary gray. Velvet Remedy and Calamity trotted ahead of me, deep in discussion over song lyrics. Velvet had somehow managed to persuade Calamity to try a duet with her, my heart felt like lead, but I was surprised that Railwright's news didn't hurt a lot more. I did not feel like a rug had been pulled out from underneath me. In my mind, I had forged no real ties with New Appaloosa, save perhaps the fond respect for the author of The Wasteland Survival Guide. I never considered making it my home, particularly not after learning why Calamity had refused to make it his. So, I was no more adrift now than I had been last night. I checked my pit buck. Its auto map had several new locations flagged now, including one towards which we were traveling. Manhattan. Calamity had bothered quite well, gaining us metal supplies, food, canteens, and even ammo for little Macintosh. He had also bothered to let us look over some maps from Ditsy Doo recording the information in my pit buck. It was from those maps that I obtained markers for Manhattan, which is less than a week's trot, and Philadelphia, 
which was not. The Bell farmhouse had proposed, possessed a small water purifier, allowing us to fill our canteens for the long walk ahead. Silver Bell was leaving behind her pink Pinkie Pie Museum. I had asked her permission, very quietly, to take a look at her party time Mintals recipe. It was now stored in my pit buck. For some reason, I hadn't felt like mentioning that to the others yet. Fatigue was beginning to take its toll on all of us. We hadn't slept, staying with Silver Bell until Dilsey Dew arrived. Even when the filly cried herself into a nightmare-filled sleep, we had stood vigil. In the distance, I could see a very narrow white tower raising up out of the sky. So high, it pierced the clouds. Part of me was strongly tempted to advert towards it, just to have a look. But it was miles away, and would add up to many hours of our trip. Instead, I'd have to sate my curiosity with a small series of buildings up ahead. I trotted faster to catch up with Calamity and Velvet. Velvet Remedy had paused her songwriting, bothered by a question. Calamity, if the Pegasus ponies live in the clouds, what do they eat? Calamity answered nonchalantly. Oh, they grow their own food up there. He looked at her. Haven't you ever heard of cloud seeding? Velvet Remedy stared at him. To Calamity's credit, he held the deadpan expression for quite a few seconds before breaking into a grin. <laughs> Velvet chuckled. Very funny. Fine. Have your secrets. But one day, I'll expect a real answer. I tried to float my binoculars out to take a closer look at the buildings, but I was barely able to get past opening my saddlebags before my levitation was exhausted. By Luna's grace, I needed sleep. Clemente launched in the air, zooming forward to do an aerial sweep of the structures. He came back, his look and grim. Raiders. Blam! Another raider pony went down. Most of her head splattered on the wall behind her, mixed with the graffiti. I dipped back behind the apple cart. The apples had long rotted away, and the raiders had taken to decorating it with pony skulls. Little Macintosh had two more shots left. I had more bullets, but I wasn't quite sure how to reload it without relying on my magic. It was strange enough firing the te gun with my teeth. Velvet Remedy crouched beside me, tending to a gash in Calamity's side. To her credit, she actually tried to talk to the raiders. They returned her hello with some extremely perverted suggestions, at least one which involved necrophilia. That's when Calamity started picking off the ponies who had taken sniping positions on the roof. Hug me to the cart, Calamity insisted. <clears throat> Excuse me? Velvet looked at him questioningly. Calamity hoof-tapped the apple cart. Instead of hiding behind it, let's use it. Hook me up and climb in. I looked between the cart and Calamity. W wait you mean you're going to pull us through the air as we shoot these guys? You can do that? Yep. I blinked. It would certainly make for a novel combat. I nodded to Velvet and she began strapping Calamity in. Moments later, we were in the air. It was exhilarating, the wind blowing through my coat, the ground no longer holding me. It was like falling, only fun. A little bit terrifying, but fun. Don't you forget to shoot back, Calamity called out, realizing that I was entrapped by the experience. A raider pony's bullet thudded to the bottom of the wagon. I suspect it hadn't been the first. My mind snapped back to the battle, and I took aim. Blam! Down went another raider pony. I lined up on a third with the scope and tongued the trigger. My target fell, blood pooling under him. This was almost too easy. Now, if only I could reload or switch weapons. 
and the combat shotgun was going to be useless at this range, and I had lost my assault rifle in the train battle. That left the sniper rifle, a weapon so large that it required either telekinesis or a mounted to fire. I looked at the cart, figuring I could brace it on the posts. Whoa! Calamity shouted as the sky filled with bullets, one coming close enough to scrape his battle saddle. Pesky varmint! Little Pit, see if you can take that one out, hiding behind them mailboxes. I'll bank so you can get a better shot. I lined up the sniper rifle, bracing it as best I could, then aimed on the scope as Calamity swung the cart around. I spotted the Raider Unicorn, an ugly mane with only scraps of purple left in her mane. She was mostly protected behind the row of mailboxes, floating a scoped assault carbine, a serious upgrade to the assault rifle I had been using before. I held my tongue until Calamity's maneuvering gave me a better shot. The raider dived almost fully into view and unleashed a torrent of bullets up at us. Slipping into the targeting nirvana of sats, I barely noticed Calamity's cry as I tongued the trigger and sent the raider to the goddess's judgment. I felt the wagon till dangerously. Calamity! Velvet Remedies cried out beside me. The wagon turned sharply in the air. I gasped. Calamity had been shot, clean through his right, wi right wing. The wing was seeping with blood, and he grunted in agony as he tried to keep the wagon in the loft. I'm sorry, folks, he whined painfully. Y'all might experience some turbulence. The wagon dropped five feet, eliciting a yelp from both Velvet Remedy and myself. Clementy caught the fall, pulling up, trying to make it to the roof of the most intact building. He made it, mostly. My friend cashed down to the roof hard, skidding along the broken tiling and the wagon slumming down behind him at a bad angle. One of the wheels snapped off as it threw Velvet Remedy and me, and I found myself airborne in the not-fun falling way. I hit the roof once, bouncing, pain bursting in my shoulder, and flew into a pile of crates and ammo boxes, the former splintering on impact. I looked up in time to see the apple cart roll over Calamity, jolting off the lip of the roof with a loud crack and proceeded over the edge, dragging Calamity along with it. Blood smeared the rooftop from his shot wing, and the wounded Pegasus gasped and kicked out with his legs, catching and bracing himself against the lip of the roof. He stopped, trembling, the weight of the wagon pulling at him through the mostly intact harness. Help! Velvet Remedy moaned nearby. The lucky mare had managed to land face first on a nice, soft mattress. Raider bedding. On second thought, perhaps not so lucky. I pulled myself to her hooves, wincing in pain from splinters and scrapes, and a brutal bru bruise in my shoulder, and dashed towards Calamity. Velvet galloped past me, her longer legs carrying her to the Pegasus' side, where she started biting at the strained harnesses. I swiftly joined her. Calamity groaned. After only a few seconds, the harness was cut, and the cart fell down the side of the building and smashed on the fragments of sidewalk below. Velvet Remedy knelt on the mattress, which she had tried flipping over to a less grossly side, only to be deterred, deterred by the colony of bugs living underneath and contemplated the memory orb we had found in the wreckage of Ditsy Dude deliveries. She hadn't actually played it yet. Velvet had taken care in cleaning and mending Calamity's wounded wing as best she could, then wrapping it in healing bandages, assuring the Pegasus would be ready to fly by next morning. Presuming, of course, that he followed her advice and stay earthbound until he could get some rest. Likewise, she had treated the rest of our injuries with healing potions and bandages. Once again, our medical supplies had been reduced, reduced below what I would have wanted. 
I was counting on scavenging more from the buildings. Surely, the raiders had been hoarding some. There was a hatch down into the building, and moments after we had cut the apple cart loose, a single raider pony had burst up from it, armed with a metal rake, whose tines had been sharpened into deadly claws. He was felled by a twin shot from Calamity's battle saddle. Even at the edge of passing out, Calamity was a perfect shot. Why a bale fire bomb? I asked, as I reclaimed my sniper rifle, struggling to put it back into its harness without levitation. It turned out that reloading bullets into Little Macintosh had been within my capabilities, still, but only so long as the beautiful gun was held in my mouth. My companions both looked up, startled. I clarified. I mean, why was it a bomb? I thought mega spells were cast. Calamity, who had curled up near the roof's hatch, simultaneously resting and keeping guard, answered. Unicorn ponies cast spells. Zebras did not. They mixed their magic into potions. And... Stuff. And fetishes. Their mega spells were either worked into enchanted missiles, like the one which obliterated Karadsdale, or snuck into population centers and detonated, like the Balefire Bomb, which annihilated Manhattan. I nodded at that, and turned my attention to pulling ammo from the raiders' ammo boxes. One locked box provided me with several grenades. Nice. Looking up to Calamity, ready to brave the building, I was hoping that all the raiders were already dealt with, and we could scavenge freely, but that was probably wishful thinking. Calamity nodded, getting onto his hooves. Velvet Remedy got up, moving past me towards the hatch. I leaned forward and bit the end of Velvet Remedy's tail, trying not to think of what it tasted like, and reined in front of her trot. Stay here, I whispered. Let us scout it first. Velvet nickered at me, but unappreciatively, but stopped. Calamity gripped the hatch handle with his teeth and flapped his wings, getting a disapproving sigh from Velvet Remedy. Pulling it open, the warm, flickering light and atrid smoke of burning trash barrels greeted us. Crouching down, I made my way down the stairs and Calamity followed. There were three raider ponies inside, barricaded and waiting nervously for us to show ourselves. I waved Calamity back, then backed up myself. A moment later, I sent several of my grenades down to see them. Oh fuck! came a voice from behind, followed by three rapid explosions, and then a silence, marred only by the sounds of falling debris. Creeping down, I found three body bloody corpses, and a hell of a mess. The rest of the building was raider free, although Calamity and I had to clear a few trip mines and disarm a bouquet of grenades hanging over the front door before I was ready to declare the building safe for looting. Sadly, neither Calamity nor I had the sort of finesse with explosives and traps that would allow us to safely collect the grenades. Disarming the grenade bouquet was done at a distance, and involved throwing a bucket and a lot of running. I returned to the stairs, calling Velvet Remedy down. Oh, I can come down now? How nice! Velvet gave me a flat expression and trotted past me. Crap. Below, I heard her suck in a breath at the slaughter below. I closed my eyes, wincing, then opened them and walked down after her. The building had included a post office, a grocery, and an equestrian army recruiting center. The last of those had taken a direct hit, leaving only two freestanding walls, one of which still boasted a very large recruitment poster. You too can be a steel ranger, it proclaimed, with an image of a rearing pony, or at least a rearing pony-shaped suit of fully enclosed armor complete with a shining lamp on his forehead, towering over a rock-strewn landscape littered with dead 
bloody zebras. The rest of the building had collapsed into a crater at the bottom. We had crash-landed on the roof of the post office. It turned out to be the most scavenge-worthy, as the raiders had stored everything from cartons of cigarettes to the most various odds and ends. I would need to build a poison needle gun. No medical supplies, however. That hurt. The grocery had long since been looted of any foodstuffs, and the raider had turned the interior into their camp. The disemboweled bodies of their victims hung from the ceilings, between filthy mattresses and pots full of disgusting food. Pornographic and blasphemous graffiti covered everything. Velvet had insisted on coming into the grocery, despite our warnings, but swiftly fled, vomiting into one of the mailboxes across the street. Trotting to the corpse of the unicorn, I picked up the assault rifle carbine in my teeth and struggled to put it into my saddlebags before giving up and carrying it around my neck by the strap along with my canteens. Calamity had stripped the other raider ponies of weapons and goods, leaving their barding behind, and now he was tearing apart their firearms and rebuilding better ones using the best parts. I trotted over to watch him. I had done the same thing before, but he was much better at it. Loved Remedy looked a little worse for wear. He called out to me as she trotted up. There's a safe in the crater that looks intact, dear. Do you want to have a go at it? I let her lead the way. Mercifully, Bobby Pin and Screwdriver was still within my abilities. As I tried to pick the lock, I asked Velvet. We need a place to rest. What do you think of sleeping here? In a raider town? She asked incredulously. Have you seen their decor? Beyond being unbelievably disgusting, it's exceptionally unhealthy. I half expect the reason they were such easy targets for you two is that they were all impaired from disease. No offense. I nickered and focused on the safe. Besides, there could be more out raiding. Do you really want to be asleep here when they come back? She had a good point. As tired as I was, this was a horrible place to bed down. The safe opened with a click. Looking inside, I found another stealth buck and a copy of Zebra Infiltration Tactics. Know your enemy. As well as several badly aged documents and a number of slightly glowing magical energy grenades. A recorded message was tucked into the back, and I downloaded it on my pit buck and listened. I'm sending you one of the devices recovered from Shattered Hoof Ridge. Intelligence suggests that the zebras have developed in invisibility spell fetishes, but this looks like something designed by the Ministry of Magic. It's even Pitbuck compatible. I hate to say it, but it looks like we've got a traitor in our mists. If some pony in MAS is leaking arcane technology to the zebras, the princess will need to take action. No voice I recognized, but this was the third ministry I only knew by name. Third of six. Six heroic best friends. Six ministries. The Ministry of Morale and the Ministry of Peace were the only others I knew about. Or were they? No, there was another one, although I hadn't learned its name. The orange bucking pony silhouette, statuette, was clearly one of the limited edition magical artifacts that Pinky, no, Silverbell, had told us about. The cutie mark of those three apples was identical to the design on the handle of Little Macintosh. The fact that I could now mentally draw a line from one of Watcher's heroines to a weapons factory guarded by pony-shaped robots without, with living brains in them made me cringe a little inside. I got the feeling I wasn't going to like a lot of what I was bound to learn about these ministries. At least, the Ministry of Peace seemed to be benign. A curving set of tracks cut a swathe through the rolling, rocky hills 
and intersected with our path. So we had begun to follow it. It wasn't exactly the right direction, but it was close, and I suspected the tracks would wind slowly back, possibly leading all the way to Manhattan. Plus, it had the benefit of being relatively flat. All the hills were sapping me. No more living in this gilded cage, Velvet Dramedy began to sing, shackled to what is supposed to be. I am ready to exit this stage. It is time for the bird to fly free. I've been blinded, cause I've closed my eyes, Calamity stepped in. His voice was no match for Velvet Remedies, but he carried a tune amazingly well. Seeing just what they told me to see. Time to get up and shake off the lies. Break their rules, stretch my wings, and just leave. Wow. For the second time that morning, I fell to my haunches, my mouth hanging open. Velvet Remedy and Calamity continued their song unaware that I had stopped, and was staring at them. I threw myself back to my hooves, and trotted to catch up. There was a part of my spirit that was just welling with happiness, seeing my friends like this. A part of my mind that was in constant squee at hearing Velvet writing a new song. And there was an annoyingly earth ponyish part of me that insisted these two we're alerting everything in our vicinity that we were here. I suspected Velvet Remedy didn't know any better, for having been in the wasteland several hours longer than I had, she had less experience with traveling through it, and her mind seemed more inclined to other paths of thought. Calamity, on the other hoof, probably just didn't care. There weren't many threads out here he couldn't just fly away from and I assumed he sometimes forgot he was traveling with two earthbound ponies. I studiously ignored that part of me. For now, the song was helping to keep my legs working. As we rounded a steep hill, Velvet Remedy and Calamity's song reached an abrupt end. I have no idea, yet, what to do for the bridge, Velvet admitted, a little sheepishly. But the chorus is strong. Calamity agreed, having taken a real shine to the project. Spreading his wings, he swooped up to land on a tall rock, jutting from the hilltops, then crouched down. Got something ahead. He glided back down to us. There's a batch of ponies clustered around a heap of vehicles, all mashed together. Calamity checked the load on his battle saddle. They look like they could be raiders. Look like? I said, warningly. Clemity paused, blushing. Yeah, well, um, better to approach cautiously. Safer, rather than sorry, and all that. Fortunately, they ain't seen us yet, so... You sure about that, pony? Said a gravelly voice coming from the air above us. The armored griffin thudded down in front of us, in a battle stance. Talons sharp as razors. A jagged scar running up her beak, and across where her left eye had once began. And a tri-barreled magical energy shotgun, in a quick-draw holster under her breast. The battle-scarred griffin was named Gawad, and we were her guests. I must admit, I found her impressive. God marched us up to the tracks, towards what my pit buck labeled Junction R7. Calamity's heap of vehicles turned out to be an old, rusted train and a stack of wagons forming a barricade over the tracks. The train cars were strange. I had never seen cattle cars before. The wheels on the engine were missing, and from the cactus veins growing over it, much of it, Junction 7 hadn't seen moving traffic for at least a decade. Ponies had converted the trapped train into a guard post. Rusty sheet metal formed sheltered huts jutting out from the wagon shack. From the stench of manure, the old switch house on the opposite side was their outhouse. Lovett Remedy lifted her hoof to her nose, eyes watering. 
Calamity noticed me eyeing the cattle cars. I've heard stories of slavers using those for transporting slaves over long distances on the rails, he muttered, adding after a moment's thought. Never seen with my own eyes, though. Taking the size of the cattle cars and the number of them on this train, it struck me. That's a lot of slaves. On the other hoof, these ponies were certainly not using them for the buying and selling of ponies. They were dressed in the same makeshift armor that I had taken from the raiders, but a closer look revealed that several of them carried magical energy weapons of one sort or another. And as we neared, most of the weapons were swiftly pointed at us. My ears flattened as I remembered one of the train ponies vaporized, leaving only glowing pink ash behind. It occurred to me, only now, that I had seen the same effect my first day outside. The watcher control sprite bot had used a similar weapon on the, sp on the bloat sprite. So maybe it was the sprite bots weren't entirely earth pony engineering after all. Despite our situation, my thoughts jumped to track. What did watchers say about bloat sprites? When you mix para sprites and taint, which is mag magical radiation, right? Or is it something different? Hoy! Gold called out. Let them pass. Me and these little ponies have something to talk about. Hooves raised in greeting. Several ponies echoed, responding, Hoys, before returning to what they had been doing before. One brown mare with a missing leg was using her peg to jam spark batteries into an array of mounted barrel, multi-barrel magical energy cannons. A pink unicorn pony had several barrels stripped out of the cannon and was cleaning them with his horn. He moved slowly, like his motor skills were impaired, but his telekinetic horn work was fluid and precise. I could see old scars, dozens at least, possibly over a hundred, all down his back and legs. He'd been whipped to the edge of death many times. I looked to my companions. Calamity had turned down, had slowed down, giving the mounted weapon a curious eye. Velvet Remedy was more concerned, if not downright appalled, at the condition of some of the ponies. A half-starved foal trotted out of the shadowed alcove of rusted metal, carrying a canteen around his neck, to which he offered each of the half-dozen ponies I could spot. Velvet leaned close, whining nervously. What are we getting into? With talon and wing, Gawad directed us to the single passenger car on the train, nestled up against a crippled engine. From the reek of dander inside, this was the only this was clearly the house of Gawad, or at least her office. Close up the door, she ordered, a blue coated earth pony as she stepped inside behind us. The door swung shut with a metallic squeal, and I could hear braces thudding into place. We were locked in with the griffin. Ironically, in better circumstances, I realized this would be a big tactical mistake for the griffin. Three against one, and at least two of us could handle ourselves in combat. It was odd, and somewhat uncomfortable to think of myself as some pony who could face a fight with confidence. Not for the first time, I had to wonder if the wasteland was changing me for the better, or just changing me. Right now, however, with my levitation magic at its most feeble, we were probably hosed if this came to blows or guns. It was the same reasoning that had prompted me to accept God's invitation in the first place. Things hadn't changed. The room was spartanly furnished, save for a desk with a glowing terminal and tattered black flag on the back wall, showing winged talons coming out of darkness. Gawad strutted around the desk, placing her talons on it, and faced us. I shook my head, trying to clear the webs of too little sleep, when I caught myself musing that she'd look really attractive if she was a little closer to my age, and, you know, a pony. First things first, 
God glowered at the three of us. Who are you ponies, and who do you work for? Calamity bristled. I could ask you the same thing. Mind your manners, Pegasus. You're in our territory, and in my home. I ask, you answer. I put a steady hoof on Calamity's flank, indicating that this was okay. Stepping forward, I'm Little Pip. This is Calamity and Velvet Remedy. We're just passing through. We also had an increasingly desperate need for a place to sleep, but I wasn't going to reveal that, much less suggest we sleep anywhere near here. Did Mr. Topaz give you permission to cross our territory? Something made me suspect a trick question, but before I could formulate a strategic response, Velvet Remedy asked, Who's Mr. Topaz? The grizzled griffin leaned over the desk and locked Velvet Remedy with her one good eye. Say again? She stared at Velvet appraisingly. Velvet Remedy stood up straight. You asked us about Mr. Topaz, some pony I'd never heard before. I asked you who that was. What's so difficult about that? I had to force myself not to face Hoof. However, God apparently saw something in Velvet that impressed on her that the unicorn was sincere. The griffin sat back. You really don't know, do you? A smile slowly crossed her beak, her scar turning it into something unpleasant. Well now, isn't that interesting? She tapped her talon tips together as she considered us. Well, Velvet Remedy prompted. Gawad leaned forward, smiling quite a lot now. Mr. Topaz is the lord and master of Shattered Hoof and all territories adjacent. Calamity nickered. I call horse apples. This ain't anywhere close to Shattered Hoof Ridge. God rolled her eyes. No, but you are less than a half an hour's flight from Shattered Hoof, the rock-breaking compound, which was named after Shattered Hoof, the battle. Rock-breaking compound. God faced winged. Really? Surely you understand rock-breaking. She stared out uncompre... She stared out at uncomprehending faces, then sighed. Sometimes, rocks have gems in them. Unless you got a unicorn who can tell you which ones do and which ones don't, you have to break them open to see what's inside. For crying out loud, you had to have passed at least one of the rock farms in order to get here. <clears throat> Velvet Remedy raised an eyebrow, confused. How do you farm rocks? Ugh, easy. You pick a plot of land where rocks have shown a higher likelihood of hiding gems, and you farm them. We were clearly not impressed, pressing the griffin with our ignorance. Waving a talon, some ponies even used to rotate the rocks around from one field to another to help improve the chances of gems. That doesn't make any sense, I blurted, interrupting. It wasn't like the gems grew in the rocks like seeds, after all. My mind twanged. Clavity only made it worse by suggesting, I think it's tradition. Well, it's a stupid tradition, I argued back. These are rocks. Gems aren't magical. A rock isn't going to be any more likely to have gems in it if you give the rock loving care or extra sunlight, or better dirt to sit on. Well, gems could be magical. I mean, how many magical artifacts use gems? You need gems to build magical energy weapons. They use them to focus and amplify their energies. I stared. First, that was way more technical expertise than anything related to arcane sciences that I had ever expected from Calamity. And second, it never actually occurred to me that gems might be magical. God sat in front of us, impatiently waiting. After a slight pause, I turned back to her. I think we're done now. Please, continue. God had a job for us. Promised bottle caps and safe passage in return. 
Naturally, we have some questions. Starting with, why us? Because you ponies aren't from around here. You've got no loyalties to any people hereabouts. And that makes you free to operate where I can't. Do things a member of Mr. Topaz's employ couldn't get away with. She gave us a narrow look. You getting me? I nodded slowly. You want us to do something that you can't do without being disloyal to Mr. Topaz. But isn't it still being disloyal to hire someone, some, somebody else to do your dirty work? Velvet Remedy questioned. Goward glowered. Now look here. I only have two loyalties. To the contract and to bottle caps. And in that order. She leaned back, looking over her shoulder at the flag behind her. My old crew learned that when they decided to take up Red Eye's offer and turn over the caravan we were hired to protect to Red Eye's slavers. She turned back to us. Talons don't break contracts. Not even for barrels of caps. They learned that the hard way, and I shot him in the back. Her smile turned grim. It was a point of honor. Shooting your friends in the back didn't sound like any code of honor I could understand. Still, God's words opened up a whole new flood of questions from us, stampeding one after another. God was gracious enough, for a little while, to answer. Red Eye, that guy in the Sprite Bots? He runs the slaves? Yes. Ironic, isn't it? He preaches all that horseshit about peace and unity and building a better tomorrow, and he's been building it on the backs of hundreds of slaves. I can't understand how so many of you ponies buy into his hypocritical rubbish. But Griffins don't? Hell no! He couldn't pay enough to make me bite into his poisoned apple. God grimaced, adding, now that he's offering, no unity for Griffins. We're just hired wings to him. And the Griffins will work for him? Yes. God seemed to take that as either offensive or stupid. Or possibly offensively stupid. The Talons work for whoever pays. Slavers, raiders, good little town folk, caravans, whoever's got the caps. We don't play politics, and we don't take sides. Unless, of course, it's in the contract. That's been the Griffin way since over 200 years. Red Eye, he gets that. And unlike some folk, he has no reservations about strengthening his forces with our kind. Talons. The Talons, God boasted, looking back at the flag. Have been the best mercs in the equestrian wasteland since before Equestria was a wasteland. She thumped her armor proudly. Can't hire yourself any better. Why does... But God had finally reached the end of her conversational composure. Enough! I'm not your fucking teacher. I am the one who is here hiring you to perform a service. I get it done, and done right, and you can ask me everything you want. As I lead you safely out of here. I looked at my companions. The chore itself shouldn't be too hard. It was, after all, right in my skill set. I'd barely need the magic I barely had. God clicked her talons together again. Oh, and one last thing. Why did I know it wasn't going to end, going like this? What? Collateral, God smiled, a cold and friendless smile. Not that I don't trust you, but I need to make sure you don't plan to march in there and tell Deadeye is all about our little arrangement. So, one of you is staying behind with me. Oh, hell no, Calamity all but growled. Or maybe, instead, I suggested reasonably, you could sit on my horn and spin. God actually smirked at that. She opened her talons in a wave. If you decide you don't want the job, you're free to go. I'll just have the ponies outside open the door and tell them you're not under my protection anymore. She raised an eyebrow, pretending to give us time to mull over the choice. You do the job. This is the way you do it. Okay, not so attractive. 
I glared at the griffin. Fine. You can have me. I winced a moment later, and clarified, as your prisoner. God contemplated for less than a moment. No. A razor-sharp talon jabbed the air in Velvet Remedy's direction. She will stay. My mind echoed Calamity's words. Oh, hell no. I opened my mouth, expecting the stream of profanity working its way up my tongue would shock even a raider. But Velvet Remedy preempted me. Agreed. What? I turned towards her, aghast. Velvet merely nodded. There are ponies here that I might be able to tend to, and your special skills are needed for this undertaking. Wait. God interrupted. Tend to? Don't tell me you're another preacher. Velvet Remedy fixed the griffin with a stare of her own. Maybe you should have asked more about me before insisting that I stay here with you. Calamity plasmed me the binoculars and crouched back down behind a formation of boulders lined on the hilltop. I took them and looked down into the small, unnatural valley surrounded by ridges. Several rows of tracks cut through the valley, ending at the iron-gated mouth of a fortress. Walls of concrete and barred windows rose up from the ground, surrounding a courtyard, most of which was barely visible through the roof of razor wire, although there was a gaping hole in the razor wire towards one end that some pony on a better day could drop boxcars through. The broken remains of a road cut by multiple concrete barriers terminated at a second gate, a thick metal beneath the watchtower. I could see a scarce few ponies walking between it and the towers. Shattered Hoof Re-Educational Stockyard Reforming Adherent Morale Throughout Hard Work and Loving Care We had been warned that the surrounding valley had been mined. The road would be a killing zone. And even if I went it alone, using the stealth buck, I doubted I would be able to get through that door. It looked like it would only open from the inside. If we were going to sneak in, there was only one way to go. I looked at Calamity, and I saw that he came to the same conclusion. I figure we wait till it's a bit darker, then I fly you in. I nodded. Are you sure your wing's up for it? Somebody stretched out his bandaged wings and gave it a few flaps. Yep, good to go. Take more than a bullet to take me out of the sky. He quickly added, When I'm not pulling the apple cart, at least. A shadow passed over his expression as he looked at his bandaged wing. Flying in still had risks. A dark, pony-shaped blotch against the sky. Some pony might spot that, particularly if they were on lookout for griffins. I didn't want to risk Calamity getting shot again, and the stealth buck couldn't conceal both of us. I mulled over the problem until an idea struck me. It could help, but I hated to ask in Calamity to fly on his wounded wing. Even if he had just suggested it. Calamity? Remember those mattresses back in the grocery store? I asked. An hour later, the clouded sky darkened and Calamity gently circled towards the huge hole in the razor wire above the rock-breaking yard. His forelegs wrapped around me, and I, in turn, strained my telekinesis to keep the cover sheet from one of the raiders' outpost mattresses flying along beneath us. The mounted, mostly gray color of the rectangle camouflaged our shapes against the sky. Shattered Hoof had become the home of escaped slaves. Many from the train that had been ambushed at Junction R9, R7, who had turned to a life of raiding the local farms. The very idea made my stomach tighten. Having fought to save several captured ponies, risking my life and those of my friends, not to mention the lives of the innocent train ponies, to give them freedom, the mere idea that former slaves would turn to the most vile sorts of barbarianism 
made my skin, skin want to tear itself off. The leader was a pony named Dead Eyes, who spoke for a supposedly higher pony whom no one but Dead Eyes had ever seen, Mr. Topaz. It was for Mr. Topaz that Dead Eyes organized raiding parties out of Shattered Hoof and kept the rock breaking yards in operation. Inside that fortress, God had told us, securing Dead Eyes' office was a safe, and in the safe was a ledger. God wanted it. She didn't say why. Honestly, I had my own reasons for wanting to take a look at that. Deftly, Calamity arrowed through the torn section of razor wire and landed us gently on the edge of the yard. You see? He whispered cockily. Nothing to it. Not more than a harpy later, two shattered hoof raiders trotted by. Calamity and I backed into the shadows, and I pulled the mattress cover over us. We held our breaths. Did you hear something? I heard one ask the other. Yeah, my stomach, growling. They seemed to pause there for several long seconds. The stench creeping off of the fabric began to make my eyes water and my stomach twist in knots. I was afraid I would sneeze or vomit. Finally, I heard their hooves clop away. Tossing the wretched cover aside, I sucked in fresh air. Then, Clemity and I slid along the wall to the first door we could find. It was locked, but that didn't last long. Not to say if you're supposed to be picking, Clemity commented as he stood guard by the door. We managed to break into the visitor center of the re-educational, let's face it, prison. The posters on the walls had pictures of smiling, happy ponies, bucking at rocks, revealing beautiful gems, or carrying said gems into facility matrons, who then just glowed with approval. Here, we teach po these poor ponies who have lost their way how to reconnect with pony kind, one banner boasted. Another, it's not long before our guests find themselves taking pride in good, hard work that supports the war effort. There simply weren't enough face hoofs in the world to express my feelings. <clears throat> Two vending machines stood side by side next to Calamity. Their lights flickered. Both had been pried open and emptied of Sparkle Cola and Sunrise Sarsaparilla, respectively. The latter machine, bearing an image of Goddess Celestia, raising the sun over happy sarsaparilla drinkers. We had, however, managed to loot a fair bit of old pre-war coins from both machines. It'll take just a moment, I replied, floating up bobby pin and screwdriver. The safe I was working on was not dead eyes. It was the storage safe for valuables in the visitor center, lost and found. This part of the building didn't even connect internally to the prison proper. So, we would have to brave the yard again and try another door. Calamity shook his head. Honestly, I don't feel right. I don't know why we're doing this. Ain't we helping raiders? I paused. The feeling had occurred to me too. We're doing this because we're not in any condition to fight these people. It would be tough if we were fully rested and healthy. I took a deep breath. Plus, this is the chance to dig a little info on what's going on. I don't care about what's going on on a raider camp. Except for how I can put a stop to it. I turned to Calamity and shook my head. No, not just here. Everywhere. I was beginning to put together something in my head <clears throat> that I didn't like. I've been seeing things that suggest that this situation isn't normal for the equestrian wasteland. My first night outside, I was captured by slavers. They marched right up to a raider bridge, expecting to have to pay a toll, and instead, the raiders started shooting. At the time, I just took it as luck, but I don't think so anymore. <clears throat> Clemente gave me a considering look, weighing the ideas I was putting forth. 
that pseudo-goddess at Appaloosa, she was new. The slavers there hadn't seen anything like her before, but some pony named Stern had sent that bitch here from Philadelphia to oversee things. And what happened that, like, a week ago or two? I returned my focus to the safe. Something's going on out here, and that pony Red Eye is at the center of it. Whatever as it is, it has been building up for a long time. I searched for the right words. With a mental lightning flash, they came to me. It's like a river in a storm that is just now on the verge of breaking its banks and flooding everything. Calamity sat down, tipping his hat back as he, as he and gave that a good pondering. I suppose that makes sense, Calamity chuckled. <clears throat> Sides, how often they can... Can I say I'm on a mission from... Don't. Calamity nickered. I guess not even once. My bobby pin broke. Slipping out another, I tried again. <clears throat> I had the distinct urge to see the contents of the safe, based on one of the last pre-war entries on the visitor center's terminal. The terminal itself had been encrypted so tightly that the Shattered Hoof Raiders had never been able to access it. Entry 42 Just got word that Shattered Hoof will be closing down the visitor center portion of the facility. The Ministry of Morale has decreed that the friends and family of ponies who have been determined guilty of sedation or treason will no longer have the right to visit our guests until re rehabilitation is deemed complete, for fear that our guests might spread their poison to their loved ones. As such, this is going to be my last entry. Fortunately, the severance package will be generous, and I plan to take my family and move to Cloudsdale. The world below is just a little too ugly for me to be raising my foals in. We've done our best to contact ponies with items still in the lost and found, and most of what remains will be mailed out today. Unfortunately, We've had no luck in reaching our recent guest entertainer. Sweetie Belle has apparently fallen off the face of Equestria. I've taken care to store her belongings in the safe. It amuses me that we have shut this office down just after we repainted. If some pony had said something sooner, we could have saved ourselves a lot of trouble. Not to mention Tiara's new dress, although the rest of us are upset about that. That mare is unbearable. It cost me a bobby pin, but the safe finally opened. I would discover later, to my chardon, that I could have just opened it via the terminal had I been a little more patient. Inside was a single package. Carefully, I pulled it out with my teeth and set it on the ground. I gave a tug at the drawstring with my teeth and it opened easily. I was stunned to see the statuette of a draw-droppingly gorgeous white unicorn with a sensational purple mane and tail and a daring three-gem cutie mark. There were other things in the package too, but I had totally forgot about them. Are you done visually molesting that statue girl? Calamity's words disrupted my retrieve. He looked impatient, and I blushed hotly. She's a looker, I'll give you that. But I'm guessing she wouldn't much appreciate the way you're looking at her. I was... just... looking, I stammered, <clears throat> then focused all my energy into floating up the statue and slipping it in my bags. I knew I was risking burning myself out completely, but I just had to keep her, and I didn't want to risk marring the statue with my teeth. The statue trembled, not wanting to race in the ground. Then I felt a surge of magical energy, and the statue floated up gracefully. Whatever blessing this one had bestowed, it had rejuvenated my horn. Just a little, but enough to float the statue at an even little Macintosh. I turned the hot, gorgeous mare around in the air until I could read the engraving. Be unwavering. Footnote. Level up. New perk. Stable shot. 
Your attacks are smooth, graceful, and precise. You have a higher chance to score a critical hit on an opponent in combat, equivalent to 5 extra points of luck.